Well, hello there and welcome to this discussion on tourism in Canberra and the Canberra region, uh, the capital of Australia, the nation's capital, one of the great places to live and one of the great places to visit as well. My name is Joe Prevedello and I'm joined here for this discussion by Neil Hermes, who is the owner-operator of Canberra Guided Tours, uh, one of the leading tourism businesses operating here in the Canberra region and a business that conducts an array of uh, different tours and experiences for, um, for visitors, both domestic visitors and international visitors, of course, when they are able to come back uh, and visit Canberra, hopefully in the post-COVID world. Neil, a very good evening to you. Hi, Joe. Thanks for that intro. And thanks for introducing Canberra as such a wonderful place to visit. Well, that's what I wanted to talk about first. Before we talk about um, Canberra Guided Tours specifically and some of uh, the experiences that you can actually um, undertake with Canberra Guided Tours, I wanted to talk about Canberra as a tourism destination. Now, you you have decades of experience as, as um, somebody involved in the tourism industry, it seems to me that Canberra has um, quite an eclectic range of things to do and things to see, something for everybody. Yep. Um, you know, let's talk about that for a minute. Where, where, how do you see Canberra in the context of what you would call great tourism destinations? Well, Joe, I think you're right. I think you've, you've hit the nail right on the head when you've said it's an eclectic set of things. Canberra has an amazing array of different things of different interest. But if you step back from that to start with, Canberra's in a wonderful location even to start with. Um, there's many wonderful destinations in the world and in Australia which are difficult to get to. One of the great things about Canberra is it's extremely convenient to get to. It's only an hour or two away from Sydney, half an hour by plane, a few hours by car, uh, an hour or so from uh, from Melbourne, hour, an hour by plane. Um, for a visitor, an international visitor or an, or an Australian visitor, Canberra is a very accessible place. And that's very important because, you know, there are some fabulous places you can see and, and, and hear about, but they may take you a long while or cost you a lot of money to get to. Canberra's great, one of its great features is its accessibility to start with. Um, it's easy to get to by road, it's easy to get to by plane, um, and, uh, and, and that's a good start. It's also relatively cheap to get to, so you can get to Canberra and spend a number of days and, and invest a bit of time here to see the place. But having got here, look, there's things that can appeal to children, teenagers, um, adults, families, people with a long history in Australia, people new, new Australians who have want to learn more about their, their, their Australian life. Um, it has something for everyone in terms of, particularly for Australians, in terms of learning about themselves and learning about what Australia really is. For many years, Canberra was seen as that place that was the home of the politicians and was disconnected from the rest of the country. But really what Canberra is is a, sh- a showcase of being Australian be it science, be it art, be it museums, be it uh, floral history, be it uh, events, be it um, art. In almost any field, Australia, uh, Canberra has elements to it that appeal to uh, people of all, all interests and all walks of life. It's very interesting you touched on it there, Neil, um, that a lot of Australians have seen Canberra as a place in the past that they didn't really... Uh, they weren't really too fond of or they didn't really want to mm, visit. It's true. That is definitely changing now, that, that perception, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, absolutely. And one of, the, one of the wonderful things about being a tour operator in Canberra is that I've worked as a tour operator in many places and often tourism organisations can really oversell a destination and when people arrive they have a very high expectation and sometimes it doesn't meet the expectation you have. Because Canberra's had less uh, projection in the past. People arrive in Canberra uh, without a great expectation about what they might see or how they might feel about the city and it becomes the sort of place where they, they are overwhelmed with the things that they can do. So it's very easy to over over enthuse people and give people more than they would think uh, and it's because of that very reason. And what happens then is they go away thinking, you know what, Canberra is my my capital. It's the capital of my country and it's a place I can be proud of. And when they get to travel around the various parts of the city, they then take in different elements of it and they take back to, to, to their hometowns a, a much stronger sense of, of pride in the city, 
albeit they might still not like the politicians that are here yeah. or the decisions that are being made. Um, but the city that it's, it itself is their city and a place to be proud of and has things that they're interested in and has – invariably people say, we wish we'd had more time, we'd like to – we will definitely come back. Yeah, so there's definitely a notion that um, Canberra um, um, underachieves but over-delivers for tourists, if you'd like to put it that way. Absolutely. Um, it's not one of those destinations that is often high on people's bucket list, but when they do – uh, take the time and make the time to come and visit here. They are definitely pleasantly surprised with what is on offer. I, look, I, I I never have people. We have a we have a, do, a tour that we'll talk a bit about later, which is our highlights tour. Invariably, at the end of that day, people say we were just blown away by the things that Canberra has to offer. We wish we'd spent more time here, or over the next few days, we'll now have to go back and see these things again, or spend more time in these other places that we don't have time to visit in a day. So yes, it is the sort of place that people are genuinely uh, find interesting, genuinely want to then return to, and will frequently be talking to us at the end of a day, saying, you know, when we come back in a year's time, you know, what time of the year would we come back? What things could we do then? Planning their next trip before they even leave the end of a tour. Now, Neil, Canberra guided tours, as as we mentioned at the outset. Uh, provides a range of different experiences. There's the highlights tour that we'll be speaking about in mm. detail in a moment. Um, but there's also um, wildlife opportunities and certainly wine opportunities as well in the in the growing wine district mm-hmm. um, to the northwest and to the north of the city as well. Um, but let's get to the, the highlights tour mm. now. Um, it must have been quite an interesting process to try and put together a highlights tour, sure. yeah, it was. a full day highlights tour for Canberra and to be able to sort of pack into an eight hour period the best things. How do you how do you do that? How do you prioritise the different things that need to go into a tour like that? Okay, it is very difficult. I mean, there are so many things that people would like to do in, in Canberra and it was difficult to hone it down to the sort of things that you would say to someone who you didn't know, um, you didn't know what their interests were, Uh, They were coming to Canberra potentially just for one day and what are the things that you would show them and introduce them to in the course of a day which uh, would give them enough time at various places to to take it in and and have an appreciation of the place Um, but to do enough places during the day that they feel like they've seen enough. Um, And and that was challenging. In fact, in the early days of 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 the tour company, we tried different combinations of things and different elements in the in the highlights tour but at the end of the day what we've we've struck is a good mix of the things that in the event that you could just spend 24 hours in the city that would give you the snapshot of the city which meant that you had a real understanding of the city and if you then returned uh, the sorts of things you might do on other days because it's not just a cross-section of what is on offer you have to develop a cross-section of the different types of things that mm. are on offer as well. Mm. I mean, there are certainly uh, many things that you could do in one day um, in a political context sure. or a government yep. context in Canberra. Yeah, or an art context. Or an art context yeah. in Canberra with the National Gallery and the other galleries that we have. Um, you know, or indeed you could you could focus on the local history of Canberra for one day. That's but right. you have to find a cross-section yeah. across all of those things to pack into the one tour. That's the challenge. Yeah, well, no, that's not a, that's not the only challenge. The other challenge is then to match that against the interests of the varying people that you might have on a day. So if you've got a couple of, you know, six or eight different people in a tour who have different, who have different ages, uh, come from different parts of the country, perhaps an international visitor, you have to have something that's going to be of interest to a mix, you know, a mixed group as well. So it's got a uh, the, the the highlights tour has to be able to capture the range of things as you say, and also capture the sorts of things that a, a, the diversity within a group would have. Um, and that has been a challenge. However, at the end of the day, the tour that we now have put together really does capture um, the elements of of art, of history, of the formation of the city, um, of the um, of the importance of the city as an international city, as a, as a capital, um, the historic buildings of the city, um, and the and the significance of the city in terms of its political and military sort of connections. So, um, and and frequently people will say, "Well, that's fabulous and that's great, and we've got a second day." And in a second day, I can say, "Well, look, here's some things that we haven't been able to include 
in the full day tour. Um, you may now wish to, you know, spend two or three hours at the National Museum of Australia, at the National Gallery, at the Portrait Gallery, at the Royal Australian Mint, or other places that we haven't been able to include in in a in a in a reasonable days program. Okay, so let's start to drill down on the Canberra highlights tour mm-hmm. by Canberra guided tours. Now we we're probably going to take listeners on a. Bit of a virtual a bit of a tour. tour. Yeah, absolutely. Why not? <laughs> let's, let's, let's do that. Yeah, um, and, and, and taking through some of the the highlights um, as the tour is known by um, for them. So, uh, it look logistically, it's an it's an eight or nine hour tour. It, yep. it starts at, at nine thirty in the morning. That's correct. Um, and, and it runs through until the very end of the day. Doesn't oh, it? Five thirty. Yeah, yep. five thirty. So. Um, typically, the tour would begin um, with pickups from from local yep. accommodation or local hotels. Yeah, and I'll just interrupt you there too, yep. just on the accommodation. In the last five to eight years, Canberra has an absolute had a boom in accommodation. We've got our traditional older establishments, which people love to stay at, like the Hyatt and the Currajong and Olams, the, the McCure Hotel. But we have a huge range of modern new hotels as well. So the accommodation range now is excellent in Canberra. Mm. So that, that's right. There's quite a range and it, and it has come quite a long way, certainly in the last couple of decades. I think certainly for Australians, Canberra was regarded as a big country town for it a was. while, but it is now becoming quite a cosmopolitan um, sort of city um, as well. So it's interesting It's interesting uh, that there are, are those variety of choices. Mm. Um, so the tour itself begins about 9.30 with a pick-up. Yep. And um, first of all, to give, and I think it's important, to give um, the guests on the tour a good context of the city, um, it first travels up Mount Ainsley, which That's is correct. one of the main peaks, yep. one of the main small peaks in and around the Canberra area. Tell us about that to start with. Okay, so the importance, uh, once once the group gets together at the, at the beginning of the day, um, uh, we, we do, and given the, the climatic conditions of the day, sometimes we might have a foggy morning and Mount Ainsley is in fog, so we have to reorganise the day a little and go back to Mount Ainsley a little later. Uh, because Canberra is known for its foggy morning sometimes. But assuming it's a nice clear day, we go to the top of Mount Ainsley. And the the, 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 the good thing about Mount, Mount Ainsley is it gives an opportunity for us, well, to, to begin with, to actually talk a little about the fact that this country was Aboriginal land for twenty to 30,000 years and talk a little bit about the landscape of the city as we drive up um, up to Mount Ainsley and give people a sense of how long Aboriginal people have been in the region. Um, and then... Uh, introduce the the um, the information about how the first pastoralists in European hist- times arrived in about the 1820s or so and that they came and settled the valley, which when we get to the top of Mount Ainsley, I try and get people to picture the valley as a huge sheep farm, which is what it was in the 1820s and was still when the, the location was, was selected as the site for the national capital. And... What, what going up to the top of Mount Ainsley does is it helps people get a sense of, of why, and we talk a little about the history of why Canberra was selected, why this particular region was collect, selected. When we go to the top of Mount Ainsley, we can actually see some of the elements as to, to why the early politicians selected the site in terms of the valleys and the mountains and the water catchment, etc. So it gives a good sense of why we've ended up building our nation's capital in this particular location. But Mount Ainsley is also very important from the point of view of the planning of the city. So um, when the city was, um, when the Commonwealth was formed and they decided to create a city and they decided to have a new city, not Melbourne or Sydney or one of the other cities, um, there, was, there had to be a, a, a new city built and it had to be built um, to a design. And in fact, Mount Ainsley is the point from which all the designing happened. It was the point from which... The paintings were done in 1912 mm. of what the city would look like in the future. So it's a very good place to start uh, exploring the city from the place where it was first envisaged, in effect. When you take people up to that lookout um, overlooking what is the parliamentary triangle, that original design of the city, do you find that people, um, whether they be domestic travellers or international travellers, do you find that they're surprised that Canberra was actually a purpose-built city to be 
It was built to be the capital city. Uh, they're amazed. They're amazed. One, it's purpose built. They're amazed that um, that we we had an international competition to design the city. That we took the most adventurous ideas in architecture and landscape design uh, that were travelling around northern the n- northern uh, hemisphere at the time, and we we got the best minds that could possibly think about how a city would look, and importantly, how knowing that cities. In 1910, they already knew that cities were, were, were big places, were overcrowded, they had sewage problems, water problems, transport problems. How do you design a city that doesn't have those problems, knowing that they, that they existed then, by, by then mm. in big amounts? Mm. So we, people are amazed to think that a city has been designed post, during the, since cars have been invented, since water, proper water catchments have been invented, since all the various infrastructure has been invented, and we built a city knowing all of that and do, built it in a way where not only could we make it a, an easy city to live in, but a beautiful city as well on top of that. And that's what you really get um, encapsulated when you get to the top of Mount Ainsley. You look at the pictures of the old grassy paddock, you look mm. at the city we have in 2021, and you see this amazing creation that was the best that the minds of of architects and landscape architects could have in the early 1900s. Yes, because there are only a, really a handful of capital cities around the world, national mm. capital cities, mm. that were designed from mm. scratch and built from scratch to be the capitals. And it's unique that Canberra is one of those. One of the other aspects um, that I think visitors are able to garner pretty quickly when you travel up Mount Ainsley is the fact that the natural bushland was given a pride of place in Canberra's mm. early design. And mm. people can start to get a feel about um, sort of certainly the local flora and fauna um, of, of, of Canberra as a, as a natural environment as well. Tell us a little bit about that. So you're absolutely right, Joe. It's uh, the, uh, the, the, the name, the, the, uh, the, the, the shorthand name for Canberra being the bush capital is absolutely true. And, of course, it's not an accident that was the design of the original designers, the the, the Burley Griff, uh, Walter Burley Griffin and his wife Marion Burley, uh, Marion Marnie Griffin, that they wanted not only the city to be a city, but they wanted it to be a landscape, and so part of the original design, which we still honour today, is that the hilltops and ridges and 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 and, and edges of, of the valleys are left as forests or grassy woodlands or or lakes or whatever. So we have. Um, landscape embedded in the city and entwined within the city, which means we have wildlife all through the city. I get uh, kangaroos come onto my front lawn and and eat the lawn at my house. You know, pe- people have wildlife in their in their gardens, and um, and you get a sense of that going up Mount Ainsley because we actually travel up through the bushland, through part of that, and then we see it all out before us when we get to the top. One of the important things to do as as a good tour guide, I believe, is not just to talk about sort of the linear history and, and the, the physical objects that are around, but to talk about the social aspects of the city and the psyche of the city mm. and the people who live there mm. uh, as well. That's important. And you talk about the bushland and how it permeates throughout all of the suburbs and, and certainly around the peaks like Mount Ainsley. Um, people are often interested to hear about the, the bushfire crises that, that the ACT sure. that Canberra has been through in the past. And... From Mount Ainsley, people can actually um, can actually get a good feel about what Canberra has been through in the past sure, on, the, yeah. on the bushfire front as yeah. well. Yeah, yeah, you, yes, you certainly can. You can you can see not only the challenges the city has in terms of the landscape it sits in, and and you know you've mentioned fire. We also are subject to extreme droughts as well from time to time, um, and you can you get a sense of how how the city sits within the landscape when you're when you're in that first location on our tour. Um, but one of the other things you see is one of the elements that the early um, designers wanted, and that was a city that would have its own water supply. And one of the, the features of the city is we have this huge mountain range that runs around the edges of the city, which is where our water catchment is. And, of course, it's, it's a beautiful lands, lands, a sort of backdrop to the city, a beautiful landscape site, but it's also important in terms of where the water comes from for the city. So all of those things... Can, are introduced in terms of, in terms of our highlights tour, mm. which is what we're talking about. Um, yeah. Standing at the top of Mount Ainsley as as we as we before we sort of venture into the city and have the have have the uh, the rest of our day. That's right. So broadly speaking, on 
the highlights too. When you go up Mount Ainsley, it's a good context setter for the day. Mm-hmm. You can see the physical aspects of the city. Um, you can see the, the CBD. You can see mm-hmm. the parliamentary zone. Mm-hmm. You can see the mountains further out. You can see suburbia. You can see Lake Burley Griffin yeah. right in the middle of, of, of yeah. town as well. Yeah. And it's a good way for people to just get their bearings. Yeah, it? that's right. Yeah. And what, what we do on tour is we then explain to people from there where we're, where we're going to go during the course of the day. And so people get their mind around how that would work. And to uh, to give you an idea of where we leave where we leave Mount Ainsley and head on to, mm. is we then start to look at some of the early history of, of Canberra, and on that grassy plain there were half a dozen really big old homesteads um, from and colonial times. From the colonial times that were built between eighteen twenty and through to nineteen nineteen uh, nineteen ten when the the the, uh, the land was taken back for the making of the capital, and so there's some very substantial old pastoral buildings and one of the feature ones of those is our first destination when we leave the top of Mount Ainsley and we actually go back down the mountain and travel down through Australia's one of Australia's premier uh, military sites which is Duntroon which was where soldiers who went to the First World War uh, as Australian officers were trained Mm. within a year or two of the city being formed and they took over one of those old homesteads and made it the, 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 the centre of the, the um, military barracks. And to this day, we still train our army officers in that same location. The, uh, the old building has become the officers' mess. And as, as, is, as is often observed by our international visitors with some sort of particular interest, but Australians as well, we actually have the opportunity to drive through that facility and actually look at our premier military training academy uh, by driving through it and actually looking at the parade ground and seeing the old buildings and getting a sense of what it would have been like in 1913 to have been, or 1914, to be there training to go to the First World War. Mm. So Canberra is full of that multi-tiered history, if yeah. you like. Yeah. Multi-tiered physical history. So yeah. on that site that you're talking about, that was um, one of the original early landholders in yeah. the area, a fellow by the name of Robert Campbell. That's correct. Who'd emigrated from, from Scotland. And he set up his property and, and called it Duntroon, named mm. after the city of Duntroon in Scotland. Um, so that was an early sheep grazing pastoral property, but it then later became uh, one of the, well Australia's, I guess Australia's first um, military school in a wholly Australian context. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, uh, established I think about 1911. Once Canberra had yeah. been chosen, that's right, as the site to be the capital city. Yeah. Um, that site was then developed into a military school. Yeah, and you talk you talk about the multi-tiered layer. Um, within the grounds of that, um, of Duntroon, one of the things I like to show people um, is a tiny little structure, which is, um, a, 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 it's, to call it a building is really exaggerating it. It's a, it's a small structure, which was the chapel mm. in the middle of Changi Prison War Camp in Singapore during the Second World War. And... Many people will know the history of Changi and the, the terrible things that happened at Changi and the importance of Changi in, in Australian history. The little chapel with its cross on a piece of corrugated iron was demounted after the, or disassembled after the war and re-erected in a little park in the middle of Duntroon. And as we travel through Duntroon, not only are we looking at the history in terms of Duntroon being a military academy, mm. but we have these little vignettes, if you like, yes. of... of of Australian history and, um, and uh, well, it's Australian history and our and and significant significant things like that, which increasingly Canberra is being the focus. It has that sort of focus. We are bringing important things to our to our um, to our history to Canberra and locating them here. Um, the Peace Bell, for example, on the edge of Lake George, uh, Lake Burley Griffin, is yes. another one of these. But the Changi Chapel is is a good example of the various elements that are being added to the various places we have. And these these are these are the things that enrich the experience of travelling around the city and mm. and actually seeing you know, knowing where they are and, and seeking them out. You're right. There are there are those little little vignettes as you call them. Mm. Uh, because we are the capital city, so much has come here. We've become the epicentre of so many different things. That's right. Uh, that there's, there's just an endless supply of information, really, about where you're going and what you're doing and what you're looking at. Yeah. Because important things have happened at X or Y location. Sure. 
and it really adds adds to the tour. And look, one of the things I'd say too, Joe, is that sure we have a sort of plan for how we're going to run a day, mm. and we'll have a group of people travelling. Um, but if it becomes obvious that a particular couple or a number of the people on the tour have a particular interest in something, frequently you can then just point out another thing that you might not what might not point out on another day because it'll be of interest to that group. I mean, you know, the Mahatma Mag- Gandhi uh, statue in Glebe Park. The, yes. You know, the St John's Church and the mm. and the and the and the uh, the graveyard there, the the um the uh, Serbian Orthodox Church and its paintings. There's all sorts of little things in the city which are little features in themselves but can be added uh, in and amongst the, the the regular things we would do on a day's tour. That's right. Well, we'll get to St John's Church in a minute um, in, in Reed. So from Duntroon, which is effectively, you know, if there are Americans listening, this is like the the West Point Military Academy sure. of Australia, yeah. on the, yeah. you know, on the banks of the Hudson River. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, this, this is what this place is like. This is where you go if you want to become an officer in the Australian military. It's... Yeah. It's a ridgy Didge military school. It's yeah, not that's just right. a relic. No, no. This is where operational things are happening. And the parade ground is there, and that's where the, yeah. the passing out parades occur. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And we drive right through the site and look at it all. Absolutely. So from uh, Duntroon, generally you'll take the tour back towards the, the centre of town. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, along uh, one of the main thoroughfares called Parks Way, mm. named after Sir Henry Parks, who was one of those early figures in Australian history who sort of worked to bring all of the original colonies together to form one country, Australia. Yeah. Um, you go into the middle of town there. Tell us a bit about that aspect of the tour. Well, as we drive drive back around the, the edge of the lake, of course, we then drive past um, on the uh, southern si- uh, the, sorry, the northern side of the lake and we can see the big uh, institutions, the big national institutions as we travel through, including mm. things like the, um, the National Court and the, et cetera. Um, we can also, you know, we, we travel past things like the Carillion, which are of interest to people who have an interest in music, past uh, Commonwealth Park, which of course is where Floriad is held for about six weeks every year. Uh, and then what we will do is we'll normally on tour, we will then visit uh, Regatta Point, which is where there's a, a wonderful display of the history of the city um, uh, built by the Commonwealth, uh, where we can actually look at some of the sort of... Um, the finer details of the planning of the city and how it works and, and the National Triangle and some of the... There's a wonderful model that they have so people can really get their bearings. Having seen it from uh, on top of Mount Ainsley, that's then a sort of complete orientation at that point and we can give people a... Uh, we can give people a bit of a bathroom stop and a coffee stop if they want um, and, um, and get an orientation of how the plans that were selected for the city were selected. And look at some of the plans that weren't selected, mm. some of the abominations yes, that we might what have... what Canberra could have become. The abominations that Canberra could have been, that thank, thankfully we're not. Um, and one of the interesting things, of course, and, you know, this is not, this is not um, unusual, but in a, in when grand plans are, are done and architects come up with wonderful plans, of course, over the years, things can change. And sometimes they happen with, um, with, uh, with uh, in a cooperative sort of a way. And sometimes there's a lot of argument about it. And when we go to the the visitor centre on the edge of the lake, we can look at some of the things that have changed or have been modified from the original plans. Mm. Why we have ended up with old Parliament House, for for example, remaining where it is. Mm. Why we don't have a national cathedral on the site that the Burley Griffins wished it to be, why the decision was made to put New Parliament House where it is and not in a different location. Some of these things have happened since. And so we get a bit of a sense of, of the evolution of the plan and the evolution of how the city looks as it does. Yes, and, and this is the place where you learn about interesting things like how Canberra uh, derived its name. Oh, that's a great story. Yeah, and, that's and a, what fabu- we could have been fabulous named, story in fact, as well. Oh, the the could have been names are fantastic. You know, Canberra, Canberra could have been. I mean, uh, well, we should start Joe by, say, by 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 saying that Canberra, of course, is a is a is a local name, probably Canberry with a Y on the end, and it was a name that the area was known by when the uh, first pastoralists came here, and obviously it came from a from an Aboriginal um, word. 
uh, variously described as meaning meeting place or other things. So Canberra was the or Canberra or the limestone plains. That was that was what the region was known as. But when we had this new city um, being uh, formed, of course, then everyone wanted to have a shot at the new name. Yes. So um, fortunately, wise heads prevailed and we didn't end up with um, Wheat Wool Gold, which is one that I remember, or Shakespeare, Shakespeare or Myola. Myola or Regina or Britannia, <laughs> or the one that I can never pronounce, which is the first three letters of each of the state capitals, which is something like Sydney, Mo, Hell, Bill, whatever, I can't say it. But, um, yeah, um, and they have a wonderful display in this building of all the names that were thought of as potential names for this this new capital in this new country at the other end of the world, as we as we were seen. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's a good opportunity for us to, you know, really get a sense of why Canberra, why the name Canberra, why here, what the plans look like, um, and... Um, and, and some of the history around, you know, how, how the city was formed. And, 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 and one of the points is, too, the various other locations that were discarded because Canberra, yes, that's true. Canberra was not the only location select, um, that could have been selected for the nation's capital. It, uh, there was a range. It had to be in New South Wales because that's what the, the agreements between the states said. Um, but it could have been anywhere from Tenterfield in northern New South Wales to Wentfield right out on the South Australian border uh, and down to Dalgetty and, and even Eden and uh, Marimbula were on the list. And there was certainly a push for it also to be in a cooler climate, yes. which is why it ended up where it did, yeah. um, so mines could stay sane or something along those lines. <laughs> uh, one of the com- uh, committee reports, Joe, that uh, was done at the time was that uh, one of the politicians decided that if we were going to pay people a lot of money to be public servants to run the country, they they, they needed to be in a cold climate which, which, which would keep them focused on their jobs and not make them... Um, you know, sit on a beach and, you know, in the heat. And, <laughs> right. and maybe it was a, a bit of a, a sort of a f- flow on from some history from some of the tropical capitals in the in the British Empire, perhaps, I don't know. But yes, it was decided we needed to have a cold climate to keep us all energised. I think one of the, the beauties of Canberra as well is that we have a magnificent man-made lake mm. right in the middle of the, the, you know, the physical part of the city, mm. um, and it divides the, the northern mm. inner northern suburbs and the, the central business district area from the parliamentary zone. And whenever new visitors come to Canberra, they're drawn to the lake. Now, at Regatta Point, near the National Capital Exhibition, that's an excellent vantage point to really take a good look at this lake. Tell us the story about the lake behind Lake Burley Griffin and how it came to be? Well, of course, Lake, lake Burley Griffin, as you say, is an artificial lake. It's uh, formed from the damming of the Malonglo River. Um, it was decided by the Burley Griffins that it would the feature of the city would be a land access through the centre of the city from the top of Mount Ainsley through where New Parliament House now is and it would be crossed by a water feature. And even on the very earliest maps that they did in the 1913, 1912, uh, you could see the formation of the lake in the middle of that. So it was always envisaged that there would be this water, huge water feature in the middle of the city um, and it would be done by the, the damming of, of the, lake, um, the Malonglo River. Um, that was the plan in 1912. But because Canberra took so long to build for a variety of reasons, it wasn't until Menzies was the Prime Minister in the early 1960s that they said, well, that's it, we are actually going to build this dam and build this lake. And in 1963, they completed the dam wall across the Malonglo River. Um, that's named after uh, Charles Stri- Scrivener, who was the surveyor who laid out the city. Mm. And and they they closed the dam wall in 1963. They invited the Queen to come out to open the lake, but nothing happened. There was no water. <laughs> and it went, I think it went a year, but there was no water. And then suddenly in April of 1964... When I was a young boy with my parents and we went to Regatta Point, the same location we're talking talking about, uh, we stood there for the opening and only a few weeks before the opening of the lake, um, the lake filled within about three days. Yeah. There was this huge storm out at the back of Queanbeyan in New South Wales and the lake filled and then suddenly we had this lake that then drew together the plan that had been in the making for uh, over 50 years. And... One of the th- things that struck me as a young boy, seeing that lake fill, and which is which gets back to the whole business of the city and how it's been planned, is that as the water rose, 
it rose up to the edge of where the lake would be, and 50 years earlier, Weston had planted trees along the edge of where that water edge would be, and we already had trees that were 50 years old along the edge of that lake. So we had planning yeah, wow. in place. We had planning in place that was 50 years in the making, um, and which is why this, the, the, the lake feels so... The, the city and the lake feel so connected today. I mean, the, the, the plantings and the, mm. and the landscaping all fitted together suddenly then. That's not to say we don't still have a north and a south side fight within Canberra between the various uh, residents of the city. Many cities have a sort of them and us sort of a, a thing. We do have a bit of that in Canberra. Do you live north of the lake or south mm. of the lake? But the lake really did draw the city together in 1964. And, um, and not only that, but it also created one of the best wetlands for, for, for nature, nature observation and particularly birds in the city. Um, in the in the backwaters of the lake towards uh, uh, East Lake. Yes, it's certainly a major feat of engineering, and I think everybody, even locals um, or people who regard themselves as locals, don't have the knowledge, uh, are surprised that for half of Canberra's history, mm. the lake actually wasn't there. It didn't. There I was mean, no it, lake. There was no lake. It yeah. wasn't filled. No, no, that's right. There was a river course. Yeah, yeah. But there was, but there was actually no lake there. No, that's right. And uh, and the, uh, the, the 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 damming of the the, the, the of the Malonglo River really has made, uh, and I, I can't remember the exact words that uh, Menzies had at the at the um, um, at the opening of the lake, but uh, the, the words are written in the uh, ex- exhibition centre. But he he expressed it well in terms of bringing a city together, not only in terms of landscape sense, but of course it gives a wonderful range of recreational activities. Even if you're not in the water, just running around or walking around the edge of the lake, of course, it just gives a, a feature uh, to the to the city. So to continue the tour from the National Capital Exhibition, generally the tour will travel um, across the Commonwealth Avenue Bridge mm-hmm. and into the real heart of the parliamentary zone, yep. going past uh, quite a few of the major national institutions, right. the National Library, uh, the the National Gallery of Australia. Uh, Questacon, the National Science and Technology Centre, uh, past a couple of the early public service government buildings. Yes, that's right. Uh, as well, the current Treasury Building and the John Gorton Building. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then, really, the first stop, um, place that you really delve into, is Old Parliament House. Sure, I'll I'll I'll, I'll uh, run the risk of having people object to what I have to say here, but we have some beautiful buildings, mm. beautiful buildings, the National. Library has got to be one of the most spectacular buildings in the city. But to add to that list that you had, of course, we also have the Portrait Gallery yes. uh, and the National Gallery. Uh, and what the building I regard as probably the most ugly building in the city, which is the High Court. <laughs> um, now, I know people will hate me for having said that, but um, apparently it's a, an, an excellent example of brutalism. Um, and it sure is. It's a really hard, solid, big concrete building. And that's one of the buildings along the sequence. And, of course, that the High Court of Australia only came to, us, to Canberra as late as the 1980s. Um, so that's, you know, relative, relatively recent in terms of the, the, the history of the country. So, yes, and, and having travelled through that area, we then travel on to one of the, the highlights of the, the, the day, the highlights tour, which is Old Parliament House. And just before we get on to Old Parliament House, it, it just reminded me then of something you said um, about the architecture of some of those buildings. It, it, it's important to make the po- point right now that you can be an expert on architecture, you can be an expert on, on flora, on wildlife, um, really almost on any topic, on politics, and you will be able to, to delve into it yep. in Canberra. Sure. The Highlights Tour will give you an overview, but you will be able to delve as much as you like into your area of interest. That's right. And, you know, mentioning architecture, I mean, I was on tour recently and some people were asking me about architecture in Canberra and they were relatives of Harry Seidler, for example. Harry Seidler being one of, you know, Australia's great, you know, post-Second World War architects. And he has a major building in Canberra um, that he built, um, the Edmund Barton Building, which is now the headquarters of the Australian Police. And I was able to take on the highlights tour, this this particular tour, past that building. Mm. So they were able to actually see that building, and, and, and it's clearly a Harry Seidler building. Um, and yes, but you're absolutely right. There are all these various elements that, that are there um, in, in whatever field. Yeah. So Old Parliament House, um, it's one of the places that made the cut, really, as it a did, place abs- to, to well, go it into. Could hardly, it could hardly not. It, <laughs> it could, could hardly, hardly not. not. 
uh, as a place to, to go into and have a bit of a look around on the highlights tour. Tell us all about Old Parliament House. It, it has an amazing history. It was our parliament building for our official parliament building in Australia, national parliament for something like 58 years. Yep, yep that's and, right. Um, so many things have happened in that building. Mm. Um, it's it's just for anybody interested in history, particularly Australian history, it is just a place that's incredible. Yeah, you've asked me to tell you all the stories of Old Parliament House. Unfortunately, <laughs> we don't have time in in this little chat, Joe, to do that. But um, you're absolutely right. Um, I'd start by saying, of course, that building was supposed to be knocked down if the Billy Griffins have had their way. It's on, as people who visit Canberra will see, it's on the main uh, mall that runs through the centre of the city and the Billy Griffins wanted that to be an open space. The building was always intended to be temporary. So in 1927, when they were really desperate to get the capital from Melbourne to Canberra, they built a building that was supposed to only last 50 years and a new building would be built. Well, we did build a new building, but by the time we did, Old Parliament House had become such a part of Australian history, there was no way that we were going to knock that building down. So when we go into Old Parliament House, we, we as you said, we get a, a sense of our own history, we get a sense of our own politics, but we get, get a very powerful sense of our, for Australians in particular, a very strong sense of our own um, uh, identity, li- identity and, 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 and yeah, and lifestyles. The things, mm. just the mechanics of the building. Seeing, seeing the um, Prime Minister's suites set up as it was in 1988 when Bob Hawke packed his bag, and then opened his new office in New Parliament House. 1988 is is kept is captured in a moment in time. Anyone who was in an office anywhere in Australia in 1988, walking into that building, into that room will see the things that they had on their desk in terms of the, you know, the, the, the artefacts, mm. the, the, the ashtrays and the IBM typewriters, etc. So it's more than just the politics. It's more than just the history. It's the, the lives we lived and the things that we can remember from that time. One of the really fabulous things about going through Old Parliament House is that um, it's an opportunity for visitors to actually sit in the Senate chamber, sit in the House of Representatives chamber, sit in the media rooms, sit in the Prime Minister's office and get a real sense of how our political system works in in a very visceral sort of way. You don't get that when you go to New Parliament House you, because no. you're excluded from going to those... those that, you can see them, but you can't sit in the, the party room, for example. Um, That's right. It's so part of the beauty of the tour that you yeah. get to see behind the scenes yeah. at Old Parliament House of what you cannot yeah. see at New Parliament yeah. House. Yeah, but which, which still exists mm. and how po- politics is being run today as we speak. So you get to see the set from be- from behind the scenes, if you like. But you get to see what it was from 1927 through to 1988 and you get to sit in the chair that, literally sit in the chair that every minister of the Australian Parliament between 1927 and 1988 actually sat in. Um, you can't sit in the Prime Minister's chair because they have that little fenced off, mm. but you can sit there in the chamber and get a sense of, of how it would be to actually be there making the decisions. And depending on where people come from and what their interests are, we can sort of delve a bit more into how that works and what their understanding of how the, our system of politics works. One of the things I do love to do in Old Parliament House is... is help people get an understanding of how we were so fortunate in 1901 to be able to say, well, we want the best of the American system, we want the best of the English system, Mm. we want the best of the French system. Mm. We'd seen how democracies worked and we knew that we needed a a combination of of things to make it work for our particular uh, country with our particular federated states, our particular landscape, etc. So you you get a sense of all of that. You also get a sense of the technologies that were used at the day, how they actually made it physically work in 1927 or 19, you know, the adding of the radio studios to the backs of the chambers, yes. for example, yes. uh, in 1947. I think it was or, during during the war years. Yeah. yeah. So when the media, that when the Prime Minister of the day, maybe it was Curtin, maybe it was, uh, um, I can't remember which Prime Minister, but one of them felt that, the press weren't uh, reporting the press as as, it, as 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 widely as they might in the printed form, uh, and we had radio then, and so the ABC was brought in and brought to broadcast the, the Parliament for the first time in the late forties, 
And that, of course, has been expanded in the new Parliament House to include TV as well. And there were certainly major concerns at the time from a lot of the politicians and the people involved in politics that uh, the public wouldn't uh, wouldn't accept or wouldn't be quite fond of the machinations of politics. And there was actually quite a movement to yep. to stop the broadcasting of, of daily parliament because people would find it so out of touch and so rude. Yeah, well, there was that. And, and you know, there's all sorts of stories in Old Parliament House. And one of the ones that I like is one about the the, parli- the um, member from wherever it was, I don't know, Hunter Valley or wherever, mm. and he got up in the middle of a speech about, you know, the price of mutton or something, said, oh, and incidentally, Bill, if I'm late for my dental appointment tomorrow afternoon at 5 o'clock, you know, <laughs> slot me in for That's the following right. Wednesday. You know, sending messages home via the mm. broadcast from Hansard was one of the things that, uh, that sort of crept in that at that stage but th- th- that's the sort of level of sort of anecdote and um and interest that makes the visiting of old parliament House, you know it, it is not visiting an old pol- politics building it is b- visiting a building that has full of interest full of uh, full of um uh, different aspects of our history and 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 how uh how australia you know it, it the, the the parliament uh, the the government uh, party rooms, of course, are the places where you know famous events happen, like you know John Gorton famously voting himself out of power, you know the selection of Chifley after mm. after Curtin died in office, and all these important with the Vietnam War, mm. all these things were 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 hammered out in those rooms. Well, that's right, and I think people often contemplate quite deeply to themselves when you, as a guide, you talk them through what happened in various parts of the building. And you can be standing in the House of Representatives chamber and saying, well, look, this is where this is where the government announced that it, it was going to war in 1939. This, this is where yep. um, the Prime Minister would have been um, aching and worried about aspects of the Cold War. Yeah, that's um, right. You know, this is where decisions were made about giving Aboriginal people um, the right to vote. They were the corridors where that Whit- is where it happened. They were the, they are the corridors where where Prime Minister Whitlam and opposition leader Fraser were darting backwards and forwards prior to the events of 1972. That's right. So you know it it it, 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 it is our history and the things that 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 are, that um, uh, that are things that many Australians can relate to. Mm. Um, and and look, it, it part of part of being at Old Parliament House helps people if they have questions about how our politics actually works in a mechanical sense, they can get that sorted out in their own mind. There is some, you know, some some sort of basics that people can sort of get to understand about. And it makes it much more real for them then too. Mm. And, I mean, out the front of old Parliament House as well, people are confronted by um, democracy in action with the Aboriginal tent embassy. Yeah, and sure. it's, I mean, as a guide, it's it's something you have to be quite tactful about when sure. explaining. Just talk us through the Aboriginal Tent Embassy. Well, I mean, the Tent Embassy was established many decades ago outside Parliament, Old Parliament House when it was the Parliament House. Um, it's it's become a, a more or less a permanent uh, ex- a permanent demonstration uh, concerning uh, rights of Aboriginal people. But I think I would, you know, m- move on from that sort of permanent. Um, demonstration of the public will, if you like, um, that's all now moved to New Parliament House. Mm. And on on almost any day when you travel around Canberra during parliamentary sitting days, there'll be demonstrations. People will see people from farming communities, from from universities, from the the Burmese community, or, as we have in, at currently. Um, and and it is an opportunity when you're on the highlights tour. To talk about the contemporary issues that you know are facing the nation because they're right there in on mass in front of you. Um, now people may just see it as a TV story, you know, at home where they've come from, but when you're in Canberra, you actually see it um, up front and up front and personal. Well, that's right. And if if you are lucky enough to to do the highlights tour on a par- federal parliamentary sitting day, you you certainly see a lot, so many things. Absolutely, don't yeah. you? And we'll we'll go to that aspect now. So from Old Parliament House, where you do spend about an hour on the tour, yeah, a fair chunk of time. Um, there's then the pretty short journey um, up the hill, a yep. matter of several hundred metres to New Parliament House on the top of Capitol yep. Hill where it, where it's located. Um, opened in 1988, so a little over 30 years old, and that mm. has been Australia's National Parliament building 
for that time. And that's where you, you get to see the real thing in action, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Now, uh, if people are in Canberra during a, um, a sitting period, um, we can arrange it so that a tour can actually go into the, um, the um, House of Reps for question time, mm. although that does take a fair bit of time out of the day. Uh, depending on the group and on the day, that may be, may be organised, but that's something that anyone coming to Canberra during that time should actually do if they can. But on our normal tour, when Parliament is not sitting, um, we are visiting what is one of the spectacular buildings of the Southern Hemisphere. Oh, it is. I mean, it was a billion dollars when it was opened uh, in 1988. In the 80s. In it the was a billion dollars in the 80s. In the 80s. I mean, the, the recent security upgrades cost $100 million. So it's a, it's a spectacular building. But again, it was designed with the idea of, um, as the city is, with the the democracy in action mm. for Australia. So whereas many other cities have grand buildings that are high on a hill that people up, look up to and approach from below, the architects des- designed a building that was accessible. Not only are we looking down on the building because the building has been built into a hill, not only can we walk over it, but we can walk almost, almost all the way through it as well. The internal parts of the building are very public. This provides some security issues in a modern world. However... Australia is very fortunate that we have these these institutions, particularly our new Parliament House, being such an open um, facility and, and open to the public to see what's actually happening. Um, and not only that, one of the other features of the building is that the architects who built it, uh, Italian architects um, based in New York, um, built a building that is very Australian feeling. It, mm. You can imagine with a billion dollars you could have ended up with a building that felt like Versailles or Buckingham Palace or some grand building from some other part of the world. But what we've ended up with is a building that has a very Australian feel about it. Mm. And there's lots of elements of the building when we walk through that, um, that, that reinforce that sense of it being an Australian space as opposed to some sort of guilt, um, you know, gold guilt, um, 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 17th century palace. Well, that's right. I mean, it's 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 certainly not not your typical looking Parliament building. It's, no, it, it almost looks like it. Some people describe it as looking like a spaceship. Yeah, that's right. Um, or you know, an underground burrow. Yeah, uh, or, or something like that. But it is. It, it's quite a. It's look. It's a completely functional Parliament building. Um, well, it's a it's a village. Uh, when, it is. When, Parli- when Parliament's sitting, it's a standalone small town. Several thousand people can be in there on any given That's day right. during a parliamentary sitting. Yeah. So, yeah. on our tour, we have the opportunity to walk right through. Uh, and in COVID times, it's a bit restricted. Um, but normally, we'd be able to go up onto the top of the building and go through all the chambers uh, or each of the chambers. Um, and typically, Joe, what we do is we'd have lunch at New uh, at Parliament mm. House because mm. that's a good sort of middle point of the day, um, and it's a time for people to to sort of take in um, take in what they've had for the you know for the for the morning, um, and to really you know um, uh, think through the sorts of things. It's often the time when people ask a lot of questions. We sit yeah. down and have lunch together, and we, we 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 work through what they've seen. Yeah. So I mean, at, at New Parliament House, like old Parliament House, you can certainly learn about. Um, how the government of the day runs, how our political system works um, in this country, but it really is a, an, an architecture aficionado's feast as it, well. It is. You know, yeah. there's so many aspects to the building. Yeah. It's it's very interesting that there are... Everything in the building, the way it's designed, is quite deliberate. You yes. walk straight into the marble foyer and the architect uh, wanted to create a feel in this marble palatial space of being in a rainforest. Yeah, that's right. You know, exactly. it's, and, and, and he wanted that to represent the Daintree yeah. rainforest of far north yeah. Queensland. I, I take I go back to the point where you said something about learning about something. What we certainly don't want the sense of on a highlights tour is that people are about having to learn things. It's as much about experiencing the spaces. Mm. Now, as a consequence of that, you can learn and people ask questions and they, you know, they can find out things and, and be engaged and learn about the place. But the really the, the important thing is to get a, get people give a sense of the of how the spaces work, and the, and the learning comes from that. So Parliament House on the tour, you'll spend as you said, um, lunch normally takes place at one of the cafes at Parliament House on the tour, and you'll spend probably about an hour to a little over an hour mm. um, exploring the building as well. And from there, 
it's back um, into the tour vehicle. Yes, that's and, right. And the tour continues um, with a bit of a drive around Canberra, around the embassy districts, yep, through some right. of our embassy suburbs, uh, and then also to um, some of the other parts of the city. But let's let's talk about the fact that Canberra is the capital city. We do have um, embassies and high commissions here, um, representing people from all over the world, every country, well, most countries. Well, Tell us about, about that. There's about 200 countries in the world, mm. uh, and of them, about 100 have representation in Canberra. Now, representation can go from the Chinese embassy and the American embassy, which are huge um, f- uh, facilities, right down to a small country that might have you know, an office in an office building and two people representing that country. Um, but we have 100, um, and... Most of them will have a substantial building, uh, an embassy and perhaps a chancery as well, an ambassador's residence, and many of those buildings are built in the design, in the style of the country that they're from. Mm. So it's, it really is there a bit of... some interesting it, it really is interesting and fun to drive around that embassy belt, which is on the edges of, the, of New Parliament House, um, and actually see the sorts of buildings that are built um, and get a sense of how that part of the international politics of the city works so you know i mean we don't see the ambassadors walking around the street but we may see them driving in their official vehicles um but the fact that they're clustered around parliament house and near the department of foreign affairs is an opportunity to talk through the sorts of issues that might be current in the day you know um uh, at the moment we're talking about you know issues around you know the burmese issues for example and you know we we might drive past the burmese embassy and and there'll be a demonstration happening at that time. And so there's a sense of where Canberra sits and, and how that fits into the landscape of the city. Mm. But it is interesting to drive around the various buildings, um, If uh, not on the highlights tour, but sometimes on weekends some of the embassies will be open for open exhibition and we might encourage visitors, you know, if they're going to be in Canberra for a day or two, to actually visit one of the embassies if they happen to be open on a particular day. And you can go and have a Thai, a Thai day or a Filipino day or That's an Indian right. day at one of the embassies. You, you do get a brutal sense of the uh, the geopolitical pecking order, if I can put it that way, when you when you look at all of the embassies and you compare them. Mm. Often they're next door to each other, you know, in, in you know one after the other after the other, and you know you see the massive compound of the United States. Embassy, which is on something like fifty acres there in Yarralumla, and um, you know, just not too far down the road, there might be another country that, you know, uh, well, really is regarded as a third world country that has a land, a block of land allocated to it, yeah. but they cannot afford uh, to build any building here yeah. in Canberra. Well, there's that, and and you know, you have the Pakistani embassy directly opposite the American embassy, etc. Mm. So, yeah, look, and looks, it is interesting to drive around those buildings and to. And to just take a bit of, you know, a, a bit of a feel about, and if there's demonstrations, or just observing the security around certain buildings. I mean, obviously the Israeli embassy is highly secure, mm. the Chinese is, etc. So there's a range of things that come from travelling around that space, um, and of course that just bleeds straight into Canberra suburbia. Um, it's not as though these are compounded areas away from the rest of the city. Um, the embassy areas then run directly into suburban areas, and we'll travel through those on our tour. Um, and typically, having left that, 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 that zone around the edge of Parliament House, we travel down past uh, the Mint, which we don't visit, uh, but where Australian coins are made uh, and have been since 1966. Uh, and then well, we you say where coins are made, Neil. I do, and, yeah, and, now and, you're going and, to correct me, And it's always me, a point you, of you, contention. You do, you're going to correct me here, Joe. The, the coins... They're coins, stamped here. Coins used to be made in Australia. The blanks were made in Australia, and then they were stamped at the Mint. Unfortunately, yes, you're absolutely right. We stamp the blanks in Canberra, but the blanks now come from South Korea, which mm. is very a, interesting. Which is a bit sad, really. <laughs> um, but we do have the Royal Australian Mint, where where um, our coins uh, emerge from, and uh, as so long as we still have coins, and that often generates questions and, and and things about you know when are we going to lose our five cent piece, for example, which is on the cards at some point. But having travelled past the Mint, um, and, and, and will we encourage people uh, on another day, if they're, they're going to be in Canberra for another day, that the Mint's an interesting place to visit in its own right because it has a interesting take on Australian history from the point of view of currency and economics and how, how trade works and how it used to work between the states, etc. 
Uh, and then, of course, the um, the old pound shillings and pence and then decimalisation in 66. Um, but then we get an opportunity to tra- travel around across the... Um, t- typically on our tour, we then cross the dam that that makes Lake Burley Griffin, uh, Scrivener Dam. dam. And that's immediately adjacent to one of the other magnificent rural properties or one of the original homesteads that was here in the 1800s called Yarralumla, which was taken over uh, when Canberra was formed and, of course, is now the residence of the Governor-General. And we can get a very good look at the uh, Government uh, the, uh, government House, uh, Yarralumla, uh, from above um, at the adjacent Arboretum where we can travel into a, a huge landscaped forest um, yes, so explain the Arboretum. People may not know what an Arboretum actually is. So explain what it is and explain how this one in Canberra actually came about. Okay, so an Arboretum. Arboretum is a, is a, Latin, a word derived from Latin, uh, uh, meaning a, a, a place of living trees. So Arbor is Latin for tree, um, and an Arboretum is a museum of trees. Um, an Arboretum typically is a, is a place where people will experiment with trees, plant trees from other places, often used in forestry for experimenting with, with new species of trees for forestry production in certain areas. We've taken the idea of an arboretum and we, uh, as we alluded to before, we've, Canberra's had some major natural uh, catastrophes in the past, drought in particular, but in 2003 we had a particularly bad bushfire which sadly killed four people. Um, but also burnt down 500 houses and also a huge forest that was on the adja- adjacent to Lake Burley Griffin, just next to Yarralumma. A pine forest. A, an exotic pine forest, which was a plantation forest, and it was all virtually all lost in a day. And uh, the chief minister at the time felt that there needed to be something done that would bring back something of the glory of the forest that we had without necessarily replanting a commercial forest. Uh, but the area was a mess because there was burnt trees everywhere and as it started to regenerate, it was, it was, you know, it was a, a pretty scruffy-looking space. So the decision was made in 2004 to actually establish a formal arboretum and in the style of 100 forests, each of those forests being a, 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 um, a one species of tree. So you had... A hundred trees of one species, and then another forest of a hundred species of a hundred individuals, and a hundred of them right across this landscape. And trees selected on the basis of either their colour or their size or their historical significance, a vari- variety of different reasons. And that was in two thousand and four, and now we're here we are, you know, a couple of decades later, with this forest starting to emerge. And it will become one of the great features of the city in the next 10, 10 20, 30, 50 years. Oh, it's ex- will. extraordinary forest mm. of um, um, formal forest, not a, not a nature reserve, if you like. Um, but it's a magnificent area, and, and, and you can see the shoots of it now. You can see it, it emerging. And we travel up through the Arboretum. Um, we'll uh, frequently we'll hop out and have a look from one of the lookouts back down towards the city. And well, it's a, a different tremendous vista, like Mount one. Ainsley. Yeah, that's it, true. There's a terrific view over all of the city mm. from that western side of the city back mm. back into yeah. the city, yeah. isn't yeah. there? Yeah, looking east. Yeah. Looking east, yeah. Uh, we look down on uh, Government House, uh, look down uh, onto the lake, and then, as you say, uh, across the Black Mountain, Mount Ainsley and the city in the distance. Fabulous um, uh, sort of a, a view. And later in the afternoon, as it is by then, uh, we get a lovely light on, the, on, the, on that. And, and it's also a good opportunity to see where... The new city is developing. That's so, right. So, so Canberra is growing um, and, and has been growing valley by valley over the decades. And our newest valley, Malonglo, is now coming around on the western side of, Arbor- of the Arboretum. And in fact, it's one of the reasons why the Arboretum could be established without fear of a future fire, largely, in that it will be enclosed by suburbia in the end. Um, and we can see how the city you know, develops into the fu- is developing into the future. And the latest new suburbs, including the suburb of Whitlam, um, uh, has been established and no doubt we'll have suburbs named after other Prime Ministers, um, uh, Hawke and, other, and, 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 and the other yeah. living Prime Ministers in the future in, in that area. Um, so, yes, that's a wonderful way of having a look at the city um, sort of later in the afternoon before we then head back into the city for the sort of last parts of our tour. 
Mm. It, it it really is a it's a change of tack going up to the arboretum after learning all about Australia's history and government and how we operate by going to both of the parliament buildings. You then sort of go to this natural or semi natural mm. environment in the arboretum, and it's yep. it's a really great way to sort of break up break up the day. But then, as you mentioned, it's from there really, and it's it's almost many would say saving the best till last on the tour. Yeah, and we, we, we travel to, and that's the War Memorial, and we're travelling towards the War Memorial. As we do that, though, we've tra- par- we pass a number of other interesting places. For example, the Australian National University. We skirt along the edge of that, which is a huge university on the edge of the city, one of the world's leading universities. Um, we also travel um, past uh, St John's Church. Uh, frequently we'll just go into the little car park at St John's Church. You'd think you were in Kent, that's uh, right. When you see this little tiny church built in the 1830s and 40s, um, when the, the the limestone plains, as it was, Canberra was a, a pastoral property, um, and a, and, a, and a little tiny church with a beautiful little graveyard around it, um, and the old schoolhouse adjacent to it, mm. and then swing around onto. Well, Ant- just on that, it, yep. it, it's amazing, St John's Church. In the current day and age, it's it's right in the heart of the city mm. centre, just on the edge of the central business district. That's right. And there's a magnificent photograph um, in the car park next mm. to St John's Church which shows the building, that same church. Um, I can't remember the year, but at some point during the mid-19th century, showing it in the middle of what was then a barren sheep paddock. And people yeah. say, hang on a minute, that can't be, that can't be this. Exactly. Say, no, it is. Yeah. It's, and this is how this whole area has changed. That's right. And and there's in that photo that you mentioned, Joe, there's actually a man standing. <laughs> That's right, there is. And <laughs> I sometimes wonder, uh, it was in the 1860s, I think, or whatever, yeah. if, if you'd have gone up to that man and said, you know what? Where you're standing. Where you're standing will now. Be the capital of a new country. A country that doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll be in a city that doesn't exist, and he'll look around at the dead rabbits, and he'll be thinking, "No, you, you just, you, you, no, you're Martians. We're at you know? the end of the earth here. I want to go back to." <laughs> so to, it does, it does, it does really bring back what what has happened. And and on that, of course, um, it was a treeless plain. We've planted millions and millions of trees. Mm. One of the great features. I mean, we've talked about all the the, the landscape, the, the the buildings and things in this chat, but I mean, of course, one of the things we're travelling through and people notice is the amazing trees. And if you happen to be here in autumn, it's just the most exquisite place to be in terms of the tree landscape that we have. It's just a beautiful, beautiful time of the year. Uh, spring is also a fabulous time because, of course, you've got the new growth coming on and we have Florio then as well. But the trees of Canberra are some of the most magnificent, uh, is one of the most magnificent features of the city. Um, and fortunately, we're taking more and more care with our trees today. And uh, although, you know, they, they were planting trees right back there in the 20s mm. uh, along the edges of where the lake would be. So St John's Church has beautiful trees around it. And the glebe we have in the city, of course, was part of St John's Church. And those oaks and elms that they have there are as a consequence of the of the glebe formed from St John's Church. Yeah, but it, is, it is important to acknowledge the trees. They are such an important part of of Canberra mm. now. Yeah, yeah. And, and look, one of the one of the important... One of the fascinating trees, which has not only great interest in terms of a tree, but in terms of history, is, of course, outside the uh, War Memorial is the Lone Pine Tree, which is a pine from Turkey Mm. that came from Gallipoli and was a seed taken from the tree at Lone Pine. And now in the Arboretum, we now have seedlings from the tree at the War Memorial. Mm, Sort of the next next generation of trees. Mm. So there's a history in the trees. Um, as much as a history in the city uh, mm. as well. But moving on from the, the St John's Church, one of the, um, one of the uh, things we then do is we swing around into Anzac Parade. Yes. And before we get to the, the War Memorial, which is the, it's the, uh, the, the, our final destination on the Highlights Tour, is that we get an opportunity to travel up the, the main heart artery of the city, the main the main ceremonial um, promenade of the city, mm. Anzac Parade, which na- named after the Anzacs, the Australians and New Zealanders, um, who first came together um, during the First World War when both countries were just so new. And it, it's a reflection of the history that Australia and New Zealand have together uh, that that parade is named after 
the Anzacs. And that either side of the, the parade we have eucalypts, which are an Australian tree, and we have shrubs in beds up the centre of the parade, which are New Zealand hebes, and, um, and the red gravel that connects them, which is the, the blood shared by our two nations mm. together. Very powerful um, space and is then lined by all the way up. A series of memorials. A series of memorials to either arms of the armed service or to events in our military history. Um, and it's an opportunity to talk through, you know, the significance of those things, the Korean War, the, well, the, the, the Boer War, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, um, uh, and, and you know, the importance of Canberra in that, uh, in that sense, that Canberra is the place where we make decisions internationally as to how we will... Uh, respond to to, to, to to issues around the world and what sacrifices we've made. And we, we, we take that in as we travel up Anzac Parade to then uh, to then go into uh, into the War Memorial as the last destination on our tour. Yeah, and, and the Australian War Memorial, it uh, I mean, it's, it's a place of incredible reverence, there's no doubt about it. Um, for Australians and international visitors, doesn't matter who you are, mm. you, you get a real sense of something coming over you when you go into this place. Um, but more than that, um, it's, it's more broadly, it's become an incredible museum of Australian involvement in war and our military history. And it will be undergoing a, 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 another complete revolution in the coming years. It's already an amazing museum, but it's only going to get better. Yeah. Um, Tell us about what you do at the War Memorial. On the well, team. I think, first of all, I, I, the way I explain the War Memorial is it's actually three different things in mm. one place. Uh, the first is it's a memorial. It's a memorial to those who've sacrificed themselves for the, for the nation. And there's over 102,000 names written on the walls of that, of that um, role of honour. Mm. So it is a memorial. It is a place where we go to remember the sacrifices that are given. But secondly, it's a museum. And it's not a museum to the glory of war, but it's a museum about how how these events happened. It's about the geography, the technology, the uniforms, the the the, the ways in which uh, these things were done, the histories of these various conflicts over the years. So, the the museum itself, one of the great great military museums in the world, if not you know one of the one or two greatest, um, has an extraordinary um, collection of um, of stories and um, and representations of Australian activities since 1901, and as you say, it's going to be expanded even further because we have other um, we have other things that we want to, to put on display and to have interpreted. Part of the museum, they have an interactive section where you know you can experience you can experience the uh, the uh, the 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 feeling of being in a conflict zone, either through mm. uh, a, a, a Lancaster bomber or a biplane in the First World War or a submarine in the Second World War. So there's experiences that you can have and no doubt they'll be enhanced in the, in the future with the new developments. But the third element of the, mo- the War Memorial, which is important for uh, Australians and for, the, for many people overseas as well, is that for anyone who's served in the Australian military, it's an enormous online resource as well. So people can get their histories that's um, right. From that place. So, and you don't have to be in Canberra to do that. So the War Memorial is, is three different things I- embodied in one place. Um, and sadly, we only have a chance to spend you know, an hour or so at the end of the day. Let's be yeah. honest. It's a it, place where you could spend many days. Frequently, people who are on our tour will get a taste of the museum, uh, the War Memorial, and, and some other things, and then plan out their subsequent days or their, subs- their subsequent visit on the basis of having seen what the opportunities are. But we can have an hour. We, I like to let people have their own bit of a wander in, yep. the, in the War Memorial. I think it's the sort of place that you, you lead yourself to, to see things. So I don't escort, we don't in our, in our tours escort people through um, uh, because it's a place where you really do need to do your own introspection and your own interpretation. Uh, we we'll frequently, though, then uh, gather together with people at the end of the day uh, because we finish our tour at the War Memorial. And the War Memorial doesn't just close the doors at five o'clock and say we're now closed. What's happened in recent years, and it's a huge credit to the previous director, Brendan Nelson, 
that we now have a a um, an, a, a service, a uh, an event that happens to close the doors, and it's only fifteen or twenty minutes long. It's not a, a particularly long event, but it's a very moving and um, uh, emotional. It's called the last post the last, ceremony. Last, last post ceremony, and it's an opportunity for the war memorial to to say, "Well, look, we're going to we're going to ad- identify a, a person who has deceased, uh, identify circumstances of that, and pay tribute to that person." And it's done in a very beautiful way. It's a very moving way. It's a very respectful way. Frequently, the families, uh, the descendants of the person that's, that, that's mm. died in the conflict, is there. And it's an opportunity to just sort of reflect on the on the significance of the War Memorial and what it really means to people. Yes, quite um, often you might get um, um, somebody uh, who, who who died during the First World War, a soldier who may have travelled to Europe yeah. from Australia, may be honoured on that particular day. And, That's right. And, you know, there'll be a eulogy read out about that particular yeah. soldier, um, family descendants if if there are any around um, yeah. are invited and often do attend and it's quite a moving ceremony for and, and for they'll them. put and they'll put a wreath down mm. um, and the really beautiful thing about it is that the war memorial is open to children who are visiting the memorial on the day to be to represent say a school group yeah. and have a couple of children go up and put down a wreath and sometimes people on our tour will have a reason why they would like to be part of that ceremony mm. and they get a wreath and they put it present the wreath at the end of the day as well. As I say, it's only a 15, 20-minute um, ceremony, um, but it's a very moving moment that we finish on, which really draws together you know, a lot of the elements that we've been looking at around the city and the significance of the city and what it means for all Australians when we come to that point at the end of the day. You do get a real sense, do you agree, Neil, that particularly for Australians, it's almost like a pilgrimage going to the Australian War Memorial. Mm-hmm. People people really want to go there. Um, they spend a lot of time planning mm. uh, th- to want to go there. For many people, it's the, it's, it's the reason they come to Canberra. Sure, it is. But more than that, I, I, I love the thing that you see lots of children there yes. these days. Um, and on these... Uh, at, at the various events, obviously they they go out of their way to invite veterans groups to be there. So people see veterans in the crowd. Children get to see veterans in the crowd and meet them. Um, and of course, in pre-COVID times, and hopefully it will happen again, people of all nationalities. So people from countries that we were at war with in the past are there yeah. uh, and are part of the uh, that that honouring that happens at the end of the day. So it's a it's a, a very inclusive. A uh, very mixing um, event, and uh, and sadly, the fa- we, when we do the highlights tour, we have a great day, and everyone gets you know to see lots of good things. But <laughs> we tend to s- tend to finish the day feeling a little sad because it is a moving event. Mm. Um, but uh, that's five thirty, and and you know people are cl- often making plans to return to the War Memorial or to other places. Well, that's right. So. That's really the end of the tour. Once once you've finished at the last post ceremony, um, it's then time to take guests back to their accommodation, and mm. and it's been quite a big day. Yep. Um, that what we've just gone through there is the condensed version. Yeah, sure. Of, of the day, and um, it's a lot for people to take in, but it's it's a very rewarding day, I think, for it anybody is. who decides to take the tour. Yeah, and as we said at the beginning, having done that tour, um, or participated in that tour for a day. It's almost invariable that people say, oh, my goodness, I didn't realise this city That's was right. as rich a place. I wish I had more time or over the next three or four days, help me work out what else I should do. You know, we help people plan to do other things. It gives people a snapshot and introduces them to the wealth of the city. So that is essentially the overview of the highlights tour provided by Canberra Guided Tours here in Canberra. Um, it's... The main tour conducted by the company. Um, there are a number of other tours that we can go through at another time. But if you are wanting to travel to Canberra, um, if you're not sure about what you should do, this is definitely the sort of tour that you should book onto and get onto because you will learn all sorts of different things about the city, Neil. Fabulous. Thanks, Joe. Thanks for joining us.